president says his second executive order focused on pausing travel from those six nations known to have trouble with terror shows radical Islam is a major concern to this administration and the entire world. Recently, Tucker spoke to Omar Saif Gobash, the ambassador of the United Arab Emirates to Russia. The ambassador recently wrote a book, Letters to a Young Muslim, about what it means to be Muslim in the 21st century and how to avoid the lore of radicalism. Here it is. Ambassador, thanks for joining us. Thank you. I think the most interesting part of your book, which is excellent, by the way, Thank is you. the fact that your own children have been exposed to Islamic extremism. You, you seem like not the candidate for that, not the family for that, very international. You, you live outside the Middle East. Um, but even your children have been exposed. What do you tell them? Uh, well, the first thing I think we have to be aware of is that this is part of, uh, I mean, it, it, it's simply part of the, uh, the uh, Internet and, and it's uh, exposed to, um, or rather it, it presents itself in so many different ways uh, through uh, globalization and the technologies that we uh, use. So uh, I actually worried that my, if my children weren't immune to these, uh, these ideas, then uh, really all of us are, are exposed to it. So I had to take a stand of my own, uh, and I, uh, I, I put those ideas into, into the book that I've uh, written. It, it seems like most of the sp spokesmen for moderate Islam that we see, at least on American television, are apostates. They're no longer affiliated with yes. the religion. But you are, uh, you are a Muslim, a practicing Muslim. Yes, Do absolutely. Do you think th the, the criticism is fair that moderate Muslims such as yourself haven't done enough to speak up against extremism? I used to be one of the moderate Muslims who would, who would say about ourselves that we haven't done enough to speak up about it. Uh, the problem here was, uh, and for me personally, was that um, it's, it's very difficult to kind of uh, latch on to particular ideas. Uh, you know, I'm, I actually write from the position of a layperson. I uh, uh, do not present myself as a theologian, uh, but what I am doing is I am claiming space for lay people and people of uh, uh, good, good faith to be able to come to the table and speak to the scholars of Islam and speak to the religious authorities and really kind of stake out a new area where we can actually engage in a dialogue between those who claim, uh, you know, the, this deep religious knowledge and, and those who simply want to be, you know, sort of good moral ethical agents as, as Muslims in, in the world. Is there something intrinsic to Islam that produces violent behavior? No, I, uh, honestly, I don't think so. I, I think that there is a certain reading that, that, would, uh, that allows for the violence, um, but what I think is that it's a, it's a particularly narrow and uh, it's a reading that reflects a certain kind of upbringing. Uh, and I think that you know, the, the, the readings of Islam, uh, whatever reading you're coming out with, is going to be related to the socioeconomic background that you're, uh, you are either uh, coming out of or you were exposed to. So you know, if you look at somebody like Osama bin Laden, he had all of the advantages possible. He had as well. Uh, a cosmopolitan life, he had this education, he had money, and yet he was, uh, he was looking at the Arab world and said, oh, you know, there's this tremendous injustice that's taking place, I must uh, now right. uh, fight um, in, in what, whatever way uh, he thought he could. Now, uh, I, I, that, that is a particularly worrying example of how, how things develop. Uh, we all sort of are witnesses, uh, the privileged within Arab society and Muslim society are witness to the socio-economic uh, catastrophe of, of uh, the Arab world in particular, uh, and possibly of the Muslim world. And what I want to say is that actually there are much more positive ways in which we can uh, begin to react to that socioeconomic reality. Uh, it's people like me and, and my generation who are very privileged who should be taking uh, steps to uh, alleviate the suffering of fellow Muslims and to really sort of re-establish uh, uh, a semblance of uh, economic kind of well-being and, and a functioning state in different parts of the Arab world and North Africa. So can a Muslim who takes his religion seriously, an Orthodox Muslim, be tolerant of people who aren't Orthodox Muslims? I think it's, uh, I, I know uh, many Orthodox Muslims who are uh, quite happy to accept that the world is, uh, uh, is, is full of many different uh, nationalities and cultures and, and uh, uh, religious uh, faiths. So uh, not only do they tolerate, uh, you know, sort of a, uh, those of weak faith within uh, Islam, but they're quite happy to accept that there are uh, non-Muslims in the world. So again, these are, these are particular readings, and I think that what we need to do is, uh, there is, I believe, a silent majority of Muslims who really believe in a much, much more 
more productive engagement with the modern world. Now, do they have the theological arguments? Do they have the philosophical arguments to uh, kind of stand up to the incredible pressure put on them by the radicals? This is a different question, and that's the kind of contribution yes. that I was trying to make, that there must be a set of arguments, a kind of a rules of thumb for how to uh, push back against the, uh, the uh, very strong radical, uh, small but very strong radical kind of interpretations. And thank you for providing that. That's obviously necessary. Thanks, thank Ambassador, for joining us. Thank Appreciate you. It.